So I've been trying to think of a really funny story for you guys, but I don't have a funny story for you to uh, iceberg. I know, I know. But I will give you this. I'll give you this. So in my little company, we, we have a, um, a small trash and uh, septic company that we've been building up. A little company's been growing, and so we've been um, really trying to find somebody to help us out with our uh, accounts receivables. They kind of get strung out there, and if you don't have the money coming in, it's kind of hard to, to put the money out there and pay wages. So we've been trying to really hard to try to find somebody. Well, we found a, uh, a gal that is a bookkeeper, um, and she worked for a company for 25 years, and she recently got uh, laid off uh, during the whole COVID thing. And so uh, it was referred to me by uh, my CPA. This is a good candidate for you. So because I was talking to him about it. I was like, what do you think? And he's like, well, try this gal out. I'm like, okay. So I call her. And she calls me back. And she's like, oh, no, no, thank you. I, I got another job. But that sounds very interesting. This was back in January. And so I'll let that, let that simmer a little bit. And, and um, it was at the end of March... I just had an impression. I just had a feeling to give her a communication, give her a text. Hey, how's the job working out? Is it doing good? Or are you still looking for new opportunities? Well, immediately she texts me back. I'm looking for new opportunities. Now, remind you, this girl turned me down in January, and now all of a sudden she's interested again. Long story short, this lady, she came on board. She quit her other job only because the other job was boring and she didn't have enough work to do. And I'm like, well, I got plenty of work for you to do. <laughs> Believe me, you won't get bored here. And, and so she started with us, but I tell you, just through just the listening of what God's telling you to do, dude, it, I mean, I would have never, ever thought about it. If somebody tells me no, that generally means no, and they normally reach back out to me, not me reach back out to them. And I did it anyway. I'm like, you know, this might be, you know, she lives in Strasbourg, of all places. You guys know where Strasbourg is? Yes. It's not anywhere close from here. It's like an hour and a half away from here. And so we hired this lady on from Strasbourg, and we figured out a way for her to actually work at home in, in our, in, to our office. And it's really, really, really cool how he, you know, just God just had his complete hand in all this thing. So it was, it was pretty doggone cool. Anyway, go, Joe, you're up. No, go ahead. I'm done. That's your story? <laughs> That's it. That's my story. That's my story. So icebreaker. what were you worrying about? I wasn't worried about Go. You're up, Doc. <laughs> Do the math, you. 25. The See, this is what happens when, should we practice now? Nah, we'll just wing it. <laughs> we each wing it okay to, by ourselves, but not with somebody else. So Matthew 6, 25. So I'm going to read it out of here while she's finding it, because I didn't give her a lot of help. Oh, there it is. Therefore, I say unto you, do not what? Worry. About your life. Wow. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is life, is not life more than food in the body, more than clothing? Next one. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? In um, Joseph Prince's um, let go book he said can you add one hour of life to your lifespan by worrying no but guess what you can do you can deduct from your lifespan by worrying big time right okay so why do you worry about clothing consider the lilies of the field we need to consider some things many times just look around and think a little how they grow neither they toil nor spin Yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Mm. Right? Right? Okay. Good, man. Like you too, man. You. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more, say much more, much more. clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. I want you to pay attention to this one especially. Do not worry saying... The old King James says, don't take the thought saying, okay? What am I going to do? Paraphrase. What shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall we What am I going to do? Right. I need a new staff person. What am I going to do? I need to, what, what am I going to do? They're leaving. What are we, what are we going to do? Right? Don't take the thought saying that. There's a really powerful thing in that. Thoughts come, thousands of them a day, bombarding your brain, right? You can't stop the thoughts. 
<laughs> Robin's eyes go, oh. Um, but you can check your emotions and find out. You've been going along and all of a sudden your emotions tank. I know not you, but the rest of us. No. Your emotions tank, right? You go, what the heck is that? Check what you're thinking. Check what you bought into. And here's the deal we were just talking a minute ago. Don't take the thought saying it because when you say it, you begin some things. You begin to set things in motion in your life. Your faith is released in your words, right? And this isn't about words, but it's part of it. And the other thing is that we were, I was laughing last night going, yeah, we start to say it. It goes directly into your heart, right? You start feeding that into your heart and it causes fear to arise, right? And then you talk to your friends about how bad things are. Josh got just... I mean, it's just so horrible. And then you get them to agree with talk, you. We're going to talk together more. We just do that on Facebook, right? Yeah, that's right. So on Facebook or Twitter. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, on yeah. Facebook. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we don't talk together anymore like this, right? No, no. So no, you get no. on Facebook and you get all of your friends, all 135 of them, to agree with you, that's right? That's you got is 135 friends? I, I don't know. Who's got I, over 300 friends on Facebook? I, I have five or six. <laughs> so I was like, I got like 1,500. <laughs> Think about that. The Bible says when you, when you agree on anything, more than two of you, it shall, it shall happen. You shall get it. Yeah. So then you get all these people out there and passing it on, saying how bad your life really is, and you wonder why your life is like that. Okay? So I was thinking about Joe. I brought this up. Uh, make sure you stay on camera. Um, <laughs> Joe brought this up last week about talking about worrying. And so I'm like, what is worry? Where does it come from? Where does worry, what is the the foundation of worry because what we what we've learned is fear and worry and stress and all these different things are actually the fruit of something different right right so if we really look at what is worry and and, and i'll keep it on the um on the the physical side of things more than or the emotional side of things but really what worry that i have found is coming from more of a uh a narcissistic mindset a control freak. That's what we are. You guys ever thought about that? So if, if you ever you start worrying about something, stop yourself and ask yourself, why am I worrying? And most of the time you're going to come to the end of it is because I need to control the situation. Because we're control freaks. Humans are naturally control freaks. That's why uh, whenever you're driving down the road and somebody breaks your trust and cuts you off, you are sure, all of a sudden out of control. That's why you get frustrated about it, right? Because we love to be in control. That's what we like to do. That's where most of our fights come into play. We're not getting what we want. We are not in control. We aren't getting, I mean, especially when you're dealing with somebody else. They're never going to respond the way you want them to. Even if you have that conversation on your way home, and you may ever do this, but you have a conversation on your way home about what's going to happen happen because you're going to bring up something with, you know, say your spouse and you had the whole conversation on your way home in your head or out loud. And you, and most time I win in my conversations, you know, I always win on these arguments. And so then you get, <laughs> then you get home and you bring this up and you have this whole, you know, this whole conversation thing. You got this intro into the conversation and then she doesn't, or he doesn't respond the way that it just happened in the car. And now you're thrown off. And now you're out of control. Now you're getting frustrated. Now you're getting angry. Now you're getting scared. Now you're getting whatever emotion pops in. But it's because all of a sudden you're out of control. Worry is a control freak thing. We love to be in control. Why do we worry? Why do we stress about things that we can't control? It's something in the future that we can't control. But we're going to worry about it because we want to decrease our days by worrying about it. That's the only thing we get in control at that moment in time is how long we get to live based on worry, based on what the Bible says, you know, it's, it's going to decrease your days. What else does, you know, you think about the different things that worry does to you. Um, I mean, you got, uh, what does the Bible say about bitterness? Bitterness is a, a deep-rooted thing that you've meditated on something for years and years and years, and now you're stuck with it, right? And what does the Bible say? It rots your bones. What are, what are those other things that, that um, you, you kind of talked about it yesterday, those other things that, you know, if you have fear, what happens? Well, the Bible talks about in the end times, and I think it's any time that men's hearts will fail them looking after the things that are coming on the earth. Is that like relevant right now? You know? No. Mm -mm. Could be any time, but especially now, right? So men's hearts fail from fear, right? They're going to die. Heart. <gasps> Look at all that. 
How many times do you get that response in your own life? <gasps> Look at that bill, <gasps> IRS. I didn't know I owed him eighty thousand dollars. <gasps> I had that happen once. I, <laughs> I knew it. I just was running from him. But anyway, we're all good now. <laughs> all paid up. Anyway, um, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but, but something that I thought of when when you were saying that before we go into that is that when Ed was teaching about that 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 philosophy going around in Christianity that God is in control. Well, no, he is in control of the ultimate outcome because that's his plan, right? But he's not in control of anything in your life unless you give him that control. We have a free will, guys. And I know people don't want to accept that, but let me tell you, if I decide, okay, I'm going to handle this myself, go for it, then he has no choice but to back off and wait. Right? How's that working for you? <laughs> just let me see. Um, I just want to share this out. This, in this whole um, chapter we just read, or this verses we just read, medical science has demonstrated that a large percentage, a large percentage meaning 80 to 90 or more percentage, of the diseases and the physical illnesses, including hypertension, heart trouble, stomach ulcers, irritable, the big IBC, irritable bowel syndrome, right? Heart attacks, cancers, okay, are heavily related, can be traced directly back to chronic stress, okay? Chronic stress puts you in, we have, um, we have two parts, our main parts, to our nervous system, it's way more complicated than that, but um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? So it's an autonomic, automatic nerve system, right? Well, fight or flight is sympathetic dominance, and that prepares you to fight or flight something, do something, but you're not supposed to live in it, okay? If you live in it, it will destroy your health. It'll destroy you. You're made to be in parasympathetic dominance, which is peace. Somebody go, peace, yeah. The kingdom of God is not in, in law keeping, and what that means for us nowadays is, is not in um, eating or drinking or law keeping. It's not in performance, trying to earn everything from God, trying to fix your life. It's in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, okay? Okay? Even cancers are, 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 are if something's eating, who's talking about bitterness? If something's eating away, what's cancer? It's eating away. If something's eating away at you, you better deal with it because it will manifest in eating away in your cells. Your cells know you cannot fool your DNA. It knows what you think you deserve, okay? So deal with it. Last week, I think it was when they talked about forgiveness, yeah. or unforgiveness, rather, okay? I take that, not just the people around you, which is really, really important, but how about to yourself? How much of us are carrying things from the past that we need to let go? Are you holding yourself hostage? Your DNA knows if you think you deserve something other than God's blessings, and it'll set it about automatically, nothing you can do to do, uh, do anything about it except get rid of the unforgiveness toward yourself. Yeah. It's amazing when you look at how God built us. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just, if you just look at the brain itself, and do some, some research on the brain or even the heart and how it's, it's, it functions and why it functions and what it does. And I mean, when my brother had, um, had his stroke, and he, his right brain, right brain, left brain was not communicating very well. Um, back, in, back in the day, they had said that the brain cannot heal itself. What they've determined now is that the brain does not heal itself, but it does create new pathways. Right? So if, you're, if you get a concussion, that, that section of your brain that dies won't ever come back to life. But, but there's pathways in there that's going to walk around that area and reconnect itself because that's how God built us. If you just look at the way God built us, yes, we, are, we love to be in control, but we, love, we try to be in control of the wrong things. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what Joe just talked about with the, the fear and everything else and how it jacks with your, your whatever it was in your stomach, um, that, that section, you can control that. You actually have the opportunity to control your stress. You have opportunity to control your fear. We get into these negative sides of ourselves thinking that we're going to be able to control it. But instead, we get out of control. Right? We, we, how many of you guys believe in the Constitution of the United States? How many of you guys believe that, that um, God has given us unalienable rights, not, un, not unalienable, unalienable, meaning they cannot put a lien on your rights. Unalienable rights that God has given us, and that's what the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, says is to uphold as human beings in this country. Correct? Anybody agree with that? Yes? yes? Amen. So let me ask you this question. How many of your 
God-given, unalienable rights you give up to the devil, to the evil one, every single day based on worry and fear. What a thought. Think about that. You give up your jurisdiction to your freedom, to your liberties, every single time that you fall into these traps by the devil. That's why the Bible says to put on the full armor of God. It is not to, def- uh, not to be offensive. It is for defense. It is to protect your, your head, your heart with the breastplate of righteousness, your head with the helmet of salvation, your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, right? You think about what you do every single time you sit there and you, and you dwell or you meditate on the negative and how much that eats you up. And, and Joe can attest to this as much as anybody else. He has patience to come in that are all jacked up in their neck and their back from stress. Mm-hmm. It's like, I didn't realize that when you turn 38, <laughs> that you can lose a fight to a pillow. <laughs> right? It's like, I woke up, <laughs> the day after my 38th birthday, I woke up and I couldn't walk. It's like, what happened? My neck hurts, my back hurts, my knees are like, so now you like got to do a full body check before you get out of bed. Anybody ever been there? But that's also no. because of stress. <laughs> because I go to bed thinking on something, and then I dream about that something, and I wake up to that same something, right. and next thing you know, I'm all crooked walking down the street. Why? Because stress jacks you over. Because I think that for some reason that... My stress levels, me worrying about this, is going to fix the problem. Well, what? While I'm sleeping. Exactly. Exactly. If I think about it long enough, because that's what, that's what humanism tells you to do. If you think about it and you process it, you, all of a sudden it will go away. You will become the master of your... I'm sorry, guys. That's not how that works. You give up your rights to be free, to be at peace every single time you worry. Every single time you have fear, every single time that you don't let God do what God does in you. But then that's just God didn't hear my prayer, right? Well, if you want to talk about that, you can read the Bible. Okay? The the Bible never once said, when Jesus walked around healing people, right? Never once did he say, by your prayers you've been made whole. By your persistent praying in your prayer closet, on your knees, prostrate in front of me, you were made whole. Those people never once prayed. Did you ever think about that? <clears throat> Not to Jesus, anyway. They came up and asked a question, and then what did he say? By your faith, faith you were made whole. It's not, God's not a vending machine where you put your prayers in up here, and out comes the healing. <clears throat> Right? It's by your faith that you're made whole, not your prayers, not your, I will myself through. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're giving up jurisdiction of your freedoms, of the peace that passes all understanding that God has given you through what? Hope that maybe that God's going to do what, he, you know, if I ask and, and he'll get, I'm sorry, it's faith. What is faith? <clears throat> what is faith, Joe? What is it? I'm asking you. I don't remember. I reduce. <laughs> I, re- I reduce it down. It's many things, but I because re- you know in Hebrews it says it's the substance of the things hoped for. So people go around and they say, "Well, I'm just so hopeless." I'm going. You got a real problem because you don't have any faith working then either. Because hope, faith needs hope to tie into. And biblical hope, <laughs> biblical hope is not. Well, I hope God, God's going to heal me sometime. Down in the future, God's going to pay that bill sometime. sometime. That, that's, that's human hope, right? Christian hope, Bible hope, is, is um, earnest expectation of good things from God, right? And then your faith ties into that, and it draws it out into your life, right? Well, so the earnest expectation of good things from God, what does that mean, though? How yeah. do I get that? Yeah, through the Word. Through relationship. Yep. Through spending time. I, I talked to a, um, one of my daughters, and she was all frustrated because she can't hear God. And I'm like, why can't you hear God? Because she goes, I, I don't know the difference between my voice and his voice. I said, have you ever heard his voice? Yes. Well, what does it sound like? It sounds just like me. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. So I said, how much time do you spend with him? 
She's like, what do you mean? I said, how much time do you actually sit there and talk to him? Or you just talk to him whenever things are going bad? How much time do you actually have a relationship? That's what faith is. I mean, what, I mean we all have faith in these chairs that we're sitting on, this floor that we're, we're 12 feet off, the, off of grade right now, that we have faith in this stuff. Why? Because we have experienced it physically, and we know for dog on sure that this is not going to give way, or you're not going to end up on the floor flipping around, yelling for somebody to, you know, help me, help me, I can't get up. We have faith in the things we can see, but what is faith again? What Substance. Is, Substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not, not seen, right? How do, you have, how do you have faith in things that you can't see? You have to learn to trust it. So my kids and I, we have a thing. I tell my kids to their face that I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I want to trust you, and I don't give you opportunity every single day to trust you. And so they keep bucking me, well, why don't you trust me? Because you're 14. <laughs> That's why I don't trust you. I mean, <laughs> I've been working with teenagers for flipping 20 years. I don't trust any teenager. I don't trust most adults because most adults don't understand themselves. Come on. I mean, why would you trust something that doesn't even trust themselves? They're still learning. It's okay to not be trusted. That's why I tell them, say, hey, it's not a problem that I don't trust you. You might think it's a problem, but it's not a problem to anything else. If you want to be trusted, then we, I'm going to give you opportunity for trust, and you need to step up to that point. And that's called relationship. And so when we build a relationship with God, it is, does God, do we trust God? God doesn't need to trust us. He's just like, here, come here, come here, come here, right? We don't need God, we don't need God to trust us, but we need to trust God. And right now we don't. That's why we pray and 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 pray. But we don't spend time with God when things are good. It's kind of like if you have a problem with um, a parent or a problem with a person that you, that you need to confront, the best time to confront them is when things are great. Not in the heat of the moment. Don't pull it out and throw it in their face. That never, that's so counterproductive. I mean, it makes me mad. It's like, why in the heck would you say that now? Now I'm more mad, right? If you really want to confront somebody, come up with a way to do it in love, Right? It's the same thing with God. If you want to learn who God is, you do it whenever there's not a catastrophic thing happening in your life. You do things, do it whenever everything is smooth and the, the water is just like crystal. And you sit there and it's like, what's up, God? And you sat out there sunbathing in your world with God. And it's like, what's up? And he's like, I don't know, what's up with you? And then you just kind of just talk it through. That's how we talk. Anyway, God and I talk like that. We're, we're a couple gangsters. <laughs> White gangsters from Conifer. It's, it, it's, it's crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb mess with me. No, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, that, but that's really the truth. If you really want to know how to get God's attention, hang out with him. Amen. If you want to hear his voice, hang out with him. Learn what his voice sounds like. To learn to trust the unknown, the unseen, you have to go somewhere where you can communicate with it. And that's going to be where? Your heart. Because that's where he's hanging, right? He knocks at the door of your heart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in First John, when he was speaking, I was just thinking of that. He says, um, perfect love casts out fear. How are you going to know his love if you don't spend time hanging around enough to know that he loves you? You know, and there is an element of faith in that, too. You have to believe that he loves you, but how well do most of us receive love? Mm. Other than me, of course. How do the rest of you receive love, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have plenty of head knowledge you're talking about. When I said it was in the Word, and you said relationship, and those two go hand in hand. For years, I had a lot, a lot, a lot of Word knowledge in my head. I wasn't as, as good as like Dennis, you know, when he was here, remember the guy? Yeah. yeah. But I had a lot of Word knowledge in my head, and I had it all underlined in my Bible, and boy, I was just like, but I spent so much time claiming the Word, um, praying the Word, speaking the Word, trying to, trying to get it to work. I never knew. One day, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, and I, I don't know, what am I doing? And he said, well, you, you don't know my love. Well, Yeah. So when I, when I forgot about all that and started to learn his love and to begin to trust in that love for me, then the word came alive. Then I realized that what I was praying to get to happen was already mine because he loved me, right? And that ties all into all those things that he was just talking about. But if you don't hang out with him, I mean, we know each other because I've known him since he's, believe it or not, we're different ages, but um, we've, um, I've known him since he's a little kid, right? And, um, and watching him grow up in that. So I have a natural trust for him because I, 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 I don't live with him, but I know Josh's tendencies. I know I can trust him. And, uh, 
And, but if I don't hang out with him every day, like today, we weren't sure how this was going to go because we don't hang out together. We just threw it together, you know, but we trusted God to take care of that. And um, if you don't hang out with somebody, how are you going to know? How many marriages, people don't even hang out with each other? They don't want to be together, you know? How are you going to know that person loves you if you don't let them love you? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, what do they say that you can only be loved through the capacity in which you love yourself? Mm. Right? I mean, how, how, much, how much actually do you love yourself? When you look yourself in the mirror, are you satisfied? Come on now. Come on. God's satisfied. Who has mirrors? <laughs> I got a couple, dude. <laughs> I mean, but so what if you have a flaw? So I was talking to my, my youth group last Sunday, okay? And uh, we're, I was talking to them just about, you know, how to do different things with God and all that stuff. And one, one thing that came up with was, you know, as people, we, we're kind of like, um, uh, we're kind of like a truck or a car, whatever you want to be, right? And you, you, when you're young, and I was trying to tell, t- tell these kids that if you don't deal with your problems now, you're going to have these problems older as you get older and older mm-hmm. and older, but you got to deal with these Absolutely. problems today, right? And so one analogy I came up with was right now you're a truck and you kind of got a funny noise in your engine. Right, and what this thing does is, is it, you can drive it fine, but it makes this noise, which is not normally a good noise. But you know, it's all right. We're still moving down the road. But the problem is, this thing, and this is most teenagers, they're great for about thirty minutes, and they die. You know, it's like, it's like gone, right? And then, then they got to refocus and get them back in. So these these kids, your your vehicle stops running for thirty minutes. But if you let it sit for twenty minutes, it'll start right back up and run for another thirty minutes. And so you go to counseling. You go for counseling or, or you go to uh, um, youth pastor or whatever else and, or your pastor and say, hey, this is what I've got going on. i got this funny noise going on and, um, and then it just dies. Every 30, I can go 30 minutes and it just dies and then 20 minutes later it starts back up and I'm good to go. And, and, the, and the counselor's like, well, take it to the mechanic. The mechanic will be able to figure that out, diagnose it, and, and get your problem fixed up. And they're like, oh, great advice. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. And then you leave and the counselor or a pastor is like, we made some ground roads right there, right? You know, made some inroads. And then next thing you know, a year later, the kid comes back, a year older. And he's like, hey, um, I got this problem in my, in my, in my, with my truck. It's like, it's like making this funny noise. It runs 30 minutes and dies. And wait 20 minutes, it starts back up. But there's also a crack on the windshield, right? And I'm like, and the pastor's like, well, then, Take it to the mechanic. Take it to the mechanic. And he'll take care of you. I'm like, oh, that is great advice. Thank you. I think I heard that somewhere. I'm like, yeah, we said it last year. Just take it to the mechanic. <laughs> All right? Welcome to a pastor's life, man. This is what we do every single day. What is the problem? Well, did you take it to the mechanic? Well, no. <laughs> That's what you got to do, right? But, I mean, this sounds like a silly story, but this is what we do. This is what we do. We, we see our problem, but we're too lazy to take it to Jesus, who's the mechanic, that can fix all things. Next thing you know, you're 35 or 40, and not only do you have that knock in your motor, your transmission is slipping gears, your tires are flat, and there is no windshield, front or back windows, and the wind blows through no matter what kind of storm it is, and now things are so much worse, and then they talk to you, it's like, oh, it's complicated. It's complicated. No, it's not complicated. Take it to the mechanic. And yeah, there's going to be a whole lot more work to be done because you didn't learn how to take things to the mechanic when you were younger. But as we get older, we get more and more heart issues. We get more and more hurts. We get more and more worries. We get things just compiling and and stacking up. And all we got to do is take it to the mechanic. I talked to a young lady who has got the same kind of thing going on. She was in my youth group. And we had this whole mechanic conversation since she was 14. And now her problems have just compounded. And they're all over the place. And I told her to make a list, write it down from top to bottom. You have stuff at home, stuff at work, stuff that you think about between here, between work and home, home and work. These are things that you do. And she's like, well, where do I start? I said, start at the top of the list and work your way down. Don't worry about what's most pressing. Start at the top and work your way down. This, and then take that to the mechanic and let Jesus take care of it for you. This is what you call taking back your rights so that you can have freedom in your life. You have that peace that passes all understanding. What does that mean? That means that you could be walking through the valley of the shadow of death and still have a smile on your face moving forward with confidence because you love yourself 
just the way that God loves you. You see how God sees you through his eyes. Have you ever done that? Try to look at yourself through God's eyes. God, show me how you see me. If you, want, if you have something that you have a problem with, that's your prayer. God, show me how you see them, mm-hmm. how you love them. And I'll tell you what, it is so much easier to love them whenever you see things through God's eyes. Because right now, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about what they did you wrong, how they screwed you over, how I'm out of control because of you. I'm the victim right now. <laughs> right? But if you look at them through God's eyes, I mean, and it could even be one of those things where God show me, we've all got those people that you just, like, never want to see again. Yeah, right? And you don't want them to go to hell. But my prayer is, God, just put them on the other side of heaven. Yeah. When we get there. I don't, I don't want them to be my neighbors. I want them to just go on the other side of heaven. I want them to show up. But just over there, right? <laughs> but, and then you say, how do you see them? How do you see me? If you want to learn how to love yourself and receive love, learn how God loves you. And you will all of a sudden see his love. And that's part of that relationship, that foundation of the relationship with God. Wow. I know deep, dude. I know. I know. I know. See, worry is really a manifestation of a deeper problem, right? You get that right, I'm sure. It's, a, it's fear, right? And a fear-based, it's in your heart. And so if your heart's plugged up, everything we get from God is by grace, what he's already done for us through faith. We know that, that scripturally, right? But in reality and functioning in our life is your heart's plugged up with all this stuff. Guess what? Well, God didn't answer my prayer. Well, you're not receiving the answer because your heart is re- expecting something else. Your heart's plugged up with all this junk that we plug it up with. And the other thing is that anytime that you're worrying about something, you're, you're choking off God's, God's blessing for you. You choke off the grace. And it's not on his end. God isn't withholding. It's you. It's us. What is it's grace me. Hmm? What is grace? Oh. How many definitions do you Just want? Just go quick. We only have like seven minutes. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. We're good. Yeah. Grace is everything that God has done for us and continues to do for us, even though we don't deserve it. It's everything he does for us. How does it choke that off? What does that mean? Well, because when you start worrying about it, you're not in faith. And it takes faith to draw the grace. So it takes relationship, yes, which creates the faith, faith, which that will give you everything that God has given you. Yes, change life and God. Exactly, exactly. Okay, then I'm going to take it to the mechanic. You got more notes. I got it. I got mine. Um, How can you read that? So what do you? Because I wrote it. (laughs) Um, Perhaps you dread. What are you dreading? Dread is a sign of that. Frustration is a sign of that, right? What are you dreading? You dreading punishment still? From God? What about from people? What about from your past? Do you still think you deserve something? Right? Oh, we always deserve that. Yeah, Absolutely. we always do, right? But the good news is Jesus took it all for you already. We know that in, intellectually, but do we know it in here? Okay, do we know it in here? Um, has your own efforts to fix your life made any real lasting difference? You were talking about the list because it keeps building up and you keep walking. We were talking, he said, go back around the same mountain again. The same thing keeps showing up. Here I am again. Why am I here? How did I get here? Why am I still here? Okay. Well, has your own efforts changed it? Most of the time not, right? Has it brought you any peace like Josh was talking? I really want to say this to you that in myself is that if we're not seeing much change in any area of our life, perhaps it's precisely because those are the areas that you're still holding on to and worrying about or trying to fix yourself, okay? The problem is you need to release it to the Lord's hands, okay? His love and his grace never stops. I don't know about you, but I want his grace in all my areas, even the areas that we're especially worrying about, right? In Isaiah 33, 6, it's on the back of your your information packet. It says this. It's under the, under the praise. It says, prayer then praise. It says, he will be your constant source of stability in changing times. And out of his abundant love, he gives you riches of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. Yes, the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. I mean, there's, we, can, we can talk to you about how to do a bunch of different stuff. We, can, we, we, we come to church every Sunday and we sit here and we listen or we, throughout the week we listen to different things that build us up or whatever else. But really, 
what are you doing with it? Mm -hmm. Are you really, really taking yourself to the mechanic? Mm -hmm. Are you really letting God do what God does? Are you really learning his voice? Are you really, really, do we care enough about ourselves to do things like this for ourselves? We say we do, but do we really? Do we care enough about ourselves to say, I, I don't need to worry about that? Because the Bible says I cast my cares on him because he cares for me. Right? It's like, do I really care about me? And then next thing we're sitting there praying and nothing's happening because of God's not that vending machine and where you put your, your prayers on the top and the, and the answer comes at the bottom. God is not a vending machine. He's a relational God. The only reason we're here is to have a relationship with God. That's it. Angels, they're there, but obviously he got bored with them, so he had to make us. Mm -hmm. Right? So... That's why we're here is because God's like, I want somebody to hang out with. I need somebody to chill with. I need somebody to have a relationship with. And we keep screwing it up. And then we sit there and go, God, why don't you care? Where are you? Because we don't care. It's not God's fault. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We put ourselves in the middle of it thinking that we got this. We're in control. But if you read what Isaiah said, that he is our consistent source to stability in a changing world. How much does your world change in a day? It could change in a minute, right? And most of the time it does. All it takes is one look from across the room at the grocery store and you're pissed. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Of course, I'm, at that point, I'm like, why would you get so cranky so quick? There must be something else going on if you're that, that if you fuse it that short. But that's not my department, right? You think about it. If you really want God to work in your life, then you have to stop yourself. Go to your heart and let God work on you. One thing at a time. Don't try to fix the whole thing. That lady that um, was helping us, she's looking at our books, and she's like, oh, my gosh, you guys needed me like five years ago. <laughs> I'm like, I know. <laughs> she goes, it's going to take some time to get this thing fixed up. It took you time to get into it. It's going to take you some time to get out of this. But it's one thing at a time that you do. And if you're hanging out with God and you want some answers for your life, one thing at a time. You don't sit there and make a cake by putting everything in one bowl and throw it into a pan. It takes one ingredient at a time. It's like the directions tell you. And then you cook it at the right temperature and you get a cake that actually works. Or like Greg does, he just makes stuff up and throws it around and makes soup. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he still wins. It's like, whatever. <laughs> but does that make sense to you guys? I mean, I'll tell you what. It is... It's so amazing if you just look at how God built you to do things. I mean, we're not designed to do things. Um, what is that word that everybody, that everybody tries to use where you do multiple things at the, at the same time? Multitasking. Multitasking. Oh, I can do it. I just can't do it very well. Nobody can do it very well. Right? You, can do multiple, you can do multiple things at the same time, but you're never going to get 100%. Yeah, but even, even if you are at that exact instantaneous moment, you're not. You're only doing one thing. Right. You're but you're jamming one, a whole absolutely. bunch into your life, right? God didn't build us to do multiple things at the same time. He built us to do one thing at a time. And what does he say? Love him. You can try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, finish just exactly right. It's like... You clean your house and you're, you're sweeping and then you stop sweeping, got a pile on the floor, you go wash dishes and you get the dishes half soaped up and then you go over and do your laundry and then your laundry is fine and bee, and you go back over there and, and by the time you get back to your laundry, it's already mildewy because you forgot the dirt on the floor and you just walked through or the dog did and now you're frustrated at the dog because it's like walking through the floor. Maybe your kid did. This is what we did at my house. Is the kid just ran through my mom's dirt pile and then she's like screaming at us because she's on a short fuse all of a sudden, so then she has to go back and re-sweep it. And now the, the, the laundry gets thrown in the dryer, but they come out, they stink so bad at that because you didn't get to it for two days. And then the dishes, well, they're still there. We'll get there. And then we have to go to work, right? 
if we just do one thing at a time in our life, we just let God do what God does. How does God see us? Work on that. Be with him in the moment. Don't be Martha's. Be Mary's. You know the story? Yeah. Martha's running around doing all those things. He's talking about Mary sat at his feet. Sat at his and feet. he said, Mary has chosen the way to your thing. Don't be a Martha's. No offense, Martha's. We love you too. But, um, we, Father, we just thank you right now. For the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, for a supernatural manifestation and revelation of how much you love us, Lord. Manifesting into our brains, manifesting into our conscious mind and subconscious mind, and then flowing over into our body and flowing over into our relationships, Lord. We thank you for it now. In the precious name of Jesus, we give you all the honor and the praise and glory. We thank that you did everything you did because you loved us so much, Lord, so we could be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise him.